Letter D has been extremely nurturing, and for all you program heads who brought it to us, and for my fellow workers in the trenches, it's quite a delight to be part of this inspiration, inspirationally diverse program. Um, as we've heard throughout the symposium, the scientists and engineers, and especially the computer scientists and the mathematicians who have designed the IT infrastructure around us today, have used a small slice of approximately one-tenth of one percent of the federal budget from the NIDRD agencies and transformed it into improvements in our daily lives as citizens. Corporate America and Govern America were further able to transform this knowledge and this world-leading IT capability into products and services that account for two-thirds of the increase in the nation's productivity over the 20 years of NIDRD and at the same time a high-value percentage of our export. The purpose of this session and of this brief talk is along the same storyline but with an inward focus. My story is that these same scientists and engineers, computer scientists and mathematicians took these same NIDRD funded capabilities and transformed science and engineering too. Furthermore, they created a new field, computational science and engineering, while doing so. Hence my title, uh, HPC in S&E, uh, the tree and the fruit. So uh, I guess uh, the, the bullets in transforming between Mac and, and uh, Windows are not perfect, <laughs> but we'll make do. Uh, I just wanted to uh, emphasize it's often said that simulation is the third pillar of scientific discovery, but I really don't find it a different, I just a hybrid of the first two pillars of theory and experiment. It's a means of scientific discovery that employs a computer system to simulate a physical system according to laws derived from theory and experiment. And simulation, like everything else, has been driven by price and capability. And you see here some real data on scientific applications over the last 20 years or so uh, in terms of the Gordon Bell Price Performance Award and the Gordon Bell Peak Performance Award. Uh, six different applications over you know, the, the multiple decades history of this award. And what you see is that all the uh, zeros in cost of the uh, price performance have gone over into the zeros of uh, absolute performance. We've had approximately a million fold improvement in productivity per installed gigaflops on real apps as well as a million fold imp raw improvement if cost is no object. And I ju just some you know, whimsical remarks on those. You didn't see that in the aviation industry over the past 20 years. If you had a 15 hour flight between JFK and Narita would be 1 20th of a second today. If we had similar improvements in storage, the Library of Congress, at least the print uh, equivalent of it, would be held in our offices. And uh, being from higher education, I have to point out that if we've had the similar price performance in higher education over the last 20 years, a year at a, at a college in the USA would cost about 20 cents. Uh, so how to use any quantity whose price is predictably improving, and by the way, in case you didn't know, we have standard reference material peanut butter in the National Institutes. And uh, today, after recent shocks in peanut butter pricing, it costs about uh, $1,150 a ton, and at that price, it's a luxury. We make sandwiches with it. But if we knew that in three years it would be $115 a ton, we'd go through the recipe books and figure out all the other oils to substitute in favor of peanut oil. If we knew that this would increase uh, in, in price performance down to $1,150 a ton, we'd figure out how to make plastics. Uh, if we knew that we'd get down to $1.15, we'd figure out how to heat our homes. Eventually, we'd figure out how to pave some of those new roads <laughs> that, uh, Professor, uh, that Senator Gore was talking about. And my point is that you know, computing has been on exactly this curve uh, for two decades and promises with some major technological challenges heading into the exascale to continue for at least a while on this. So like everybody else, scientists and engineers plan on increasing uses for it. Back in 1979, and this is a slide from the Boeing Corporation, CFD was well established in sort of the, the crude lines of the aerodynamics of the fuselage, the wing, and the fairing of the engines onto the wing. Uh, but uh, just, uh, you know, by the time of the 787, uh, the wind tunnel testing had been substantially replaced by computational fluid dynamics. And you see in green all the elements of the new design that were done with CFD. And blue is, you know, is some penetration, and red are still some challenges. And I point out that it's not just the high end of computing that has influenced uh, aerodynamic uh, design in many other industries, but things like CAD and many other uh, forms of, of increased productivity for the desk engineer. Uh, in fact, IDC did a survey in 2011, and of all the uh, factors that uh, uh, went into buying new HPC systems, the ability to do new and better science ranked above them all. If you think of uh, simulation in comparison to or in, in complementation to experiments, 
you see that it has many advantages in terms of places where experiments are too controversial to do on real subjects, where we can't do controlled experiments, uh, such as the, the environment, where experiments may be prohibited by treaty or impossible, where experiments are simply difficult to instrument and simulations can tell us a lot more in a lot more places in space-time, and finally, where experiments have become extremely expensive, requiring international campaigns involving about half of the world's people, such as the uh, International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor in France, designed to bring us fusion, which has tripled its estimated price tag to about $22 billion. You can do a lot of simulation under that envelope and design the right eater the first time and plan those shots, which are about a million dollars each per experiment, well with uh, simulation. We've heard a lot about Los Alamos today. Of course, when high, you know, digital computing was invented there, it was primarily to try to understand things that had already been discovered experimentally, but which were fundamentally nonlinear and chaotic, like the weather. Uh, and a typical research organization has, throughout the years, had a high percentage of its effort in discovery through observation and experiment. And until computers were more powerful, they were primarily used just to understand. But after the sort of uh, phase change of the SIDAC program and the ASCII program and other uh, you know, sources where we came to depend on computers as predictive devices, we can now look at uh, the shift. We'll never get 100% simulation. We always need experiments. But we can do a lot of prediction and then use those expensive experiments as confirmation. And this is pervading uh, not just the physical sciences about which I'll speak, but the biological ones as you just heard. So uh, of course, uh, ex the exponential function was renamed for Gordon Moore uh, about uh, 40 years ago. And uh, in many uh, areas, that metaphor has been applied. Here is an example out of the scales report for computational fusion. Two separate campaigns, one PDE-based, one particle-based in terms of understanding magnetic fusion, riding Moore's law, the blue sloped curve for periods, and having these exciting boosts of productivity through algorithmic inventiveness, better formulations, better algorithms, better uh, interactions uh, with the hardware. Similar things have been documented in many uh, physical and, and chemical science areas. Here's uh, some uh, two different uh, clean combustion campaigns. Again, riding Moore's law through improved hardware, more detailed resolution, higher fidelity physics, more multi-physics, and occasionally a mathematical or data structure, other a breakthrough that, um, that leads to uh, you know, shooting above uh, the Moore's Law curve. And going back to that famous 1992 Blue Book, which certainly influenced me, uh, we had this uh, picture of the Poisson equation solver going through several generations from Gauss elimination to multigrid. And for a relatively small cube of space, the algorithmic improvements were equal in, in uh, magnitude to that of Moore's law over those 36 years, about a factor of 16 million from each on a constant computer half a year down to one second. On a computer that's improving you know, 16 million times, you, you get the product. Uh, I just will illustrate Moore's law with a corporate example. You can see the number of wind tunnel tests for Boeing aircraft from the 67 to the 57 to the 777 to the 787 and the new uh, very fuel efficient 737. The number of wind tunnel tests has halved over generations like its own Moore's Law, while the number of CFD runs has uh, been able to take up that slack. This uh, has also been a key factor in the stockpile stewardship program of the Department of Energy, where our ability to test devices, some of them sitting around for decades and, and you know, whose quality uh, cannot be ascertained by, shall we say, experiment, uh, you know, we've been simulating them in their uh, perhaps deteriorated state and designing new uh, devices through computation. And uh, this is just an example of what is now a fairly routine simulation on some E&M device from Livermore. Uh, it wasn't just the fact that it was parallelized and the resolution dramatically increased for this multi-scale problem, but in fact the algorithm was one uh, that allowed this simulation to be done accurately really for the first time. We can say that we're building on several um, you know, aspects of a vertical integration, ranging from the mathematization of nature, going back to Newton, the stability of floating point arithmetic. When you commit uh, you know, a, a quadrillion operations per second, you commit a quadrillion errors per second. And yet, we expect a certain amount of accuracy in the final answer. And we can thank von Neumann and all for launching that campaign. We can thank Cray and his colleagues for their maniacal attention to performance, which continues to this day. And more recently, the real news is the incorporation of best practices from commercial software engineering into 
the primarily freely downloadable uh, DOE and NSF and other agency generated uh, software libraries which have enabled someone other than the grad student who wrote them to use them effectively and has led to their curation in the national laboratory uh, system. And we really build on all four of these uh, you know, histories in uh, promoting computational science through this phase transition to a fully predictive and increasingly quantified science. The ecosystem in which we've done this in the USA is, I think, uh, fairly unique in the world. We have mission-oriented and idea-oriented organizations working hand in glove uh, for basic and applied, for short-term, long-term, for incubation and curation, for the feed corn and the seed corn. And I think in most countries, the barrier between the basic and the applied, even within the university, is more difficult. You have the, you know, the technical universities and the science universities. But here, we have a lot of interchange between the national labs and the universities, and, and in fact, uh, even internships in, in industry which make this ecosystem a very rich and almost uh, unique one. I'd like to think of uh, basic research as a treasury into which scientists regularly deposit ideas without the driving motivation of a particular project. And over and over in computer science, we've come back to a different limiting resource, whether it's the processing, whether it's the storage, whether it's the bandwidth. You just heard Russ talk about you know, getting back to uh, you know, a processing limited period of biology after a data limited period. And we can turn to this treasury and pull old ideas out. Uh, between the architectures that are available and the applications that must be executed, we have to find algorithmic solutions, which can sometimes be mined from the literature, sometimes created. And that last part is very important. Uh, when the algorithmic advances are driven by applications, we get out of our academic sandboxes and try things that are really often uh, very hard. And you see here just a few examples of, say, space filling curves and uh, conjugate gradients, which were invented as theoretical constructs, of very little practical interest at their time, and were reborn when uh, the need arose. I'd like to point out one uh, particular out of you know, hundreds that could be mentioned, but one with I, ha I have a lot of familiarity with, uh, the uh, PETSI, the Portable Extensible Scientific Computing Library out of Argonne. It is used literally in thousands of scientific and engineering codes, many single grad student ventures, many uh, corporate. Uh, and furthermore, its software structure, its object-oriented style, has inspired countless other scientific library developers. It's a suite of distributed data structures. Some people use only those, those extremely well-implemented MPI objects. Others use higher aspects of the library. It's multi-layered. It has won an R&D 100 award, multiple Gordon Bell Prizes, best paper prizes, and two of its developers won the 2011 E.O. Lawrence Award from DOE was funded by a variety of sources. It's been used in a variety of applications, including some that are you know, biological and social there, you know, natural language and so forth. Um, I like very much DOE's SIDAC model, Scientific Discovery Through Advanced Computing Program Structure, in which fundamental common tools in computer science and mathematics, like the Petsy Library, like the MPI Message Passing Library, are leveraged in a way that the the human scale could not be. We don't have enough workforce to build every one of those nine applications shown there, in, in fact, from my current uh, university, uh, in, in terms of you know, having enough expertise uh, with, with the basic enabling technologies. And so this is another aspect of the importance of software engineering in leveraging this expertise. I might add, um, you know, we, we are running out of, of performance all the time in science and engineering, whether it's because of the need for massive resolution for multi-scale nature, full, full uh, dimensionality of nature, full fidelity of nature, a combination of multiple models in multi-physics nature, the desire to run optimization loops around the fundamental forward problems, to do inverse problems for parameter estimation, to do uncertainty quantification, these all take petascale apps and make us want to throw exascale resources at them in order to uh, you know, use them in a truly scientific mode. And of course, the other exciting thing on the frontier besides taking known predictive models to greater fidelity, greater quantified uncertainty, is merging the third pillar with the fourth pillar about which uh, the next session will have a lot to say. Of course, uh, the fourth paradigm book is largely about uh, economic and healthcare and social aspects of uh, computing, but uh, sci the scientific aspects are just important where we don't have our Maxwell, our Schrodinger, our Einstein, our Navier-Stokes, 
we do have a lot of data. And uh, you know, find, mining that model-free uh, data with statistical and mathematical models is an exciting frontier, and I think it will bring the third and fourth paradigms together in an exciting way. Uh, the future of simulation will embrace data culture, inverse problems, data assimilation, integrating measurements with ongoing simulations, such as in the weather, where both the experiments and the models are incomplete, but two ugly parents can have a beautiful child. Uh, and uh, uncertainty quantification and immersive visualization and computational steering, these are things that big data bring to simulation to make it much more useful. Meanwhile, I think big data will be looking to the successes of simulation for optimal algorithms, algorithms that execute in a time proportional to the data size. We have a lot of these in, in physical models, multi-grid, multi-pole, FFT, sparse grid, important sampling, uh, you know, other, other kinds of uh, methods. And um, we're just at the beginning of this algorithmic discovery in data sciences like wavelets and compressed sensing, but there must be many others in the machine learning domain. So, of course, you'll hear more about, about that in Alex's talk shortly. Uh, my sort of uh, ode to uh, Niter D, if, if you will, in closing here is that high performance computing has been a phenomenally productive tree uh, for, you know, the fruits of science and engineering. Uh, but uh, it also is itself a fruit. Uh, coming from the NIDRD program, a fusion of computer science and mathematics that grows extraordinarily well in our innovative and uh, easy to, easy to cross boundaries uh, culture. And uh, so NIDRD rightfully enjoys the credit for envisioning and provisioning uh, HPC over 20 exhilarating years, and may they continue to stretch forward into the unimaginable. Thank you. Thank you, David. We have time for a question. Go ahead, Ed. So I, I wanted to uh, try to get you to be a bit nicer to computer architects and algorithmic people. So okay. More of a comment than a question. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so the architecture aspect is is simply that whenever we talk about Moore's law, it's important just to r recognize that you simply don't hurl transistors uh, uh, on a die and get performance improvements, mm -hmm. right? And right. more and more, it's the entire stack that has to be improved in order to bring this about. Mm -hmm. And so. That's, you know, architects are one, I'm not one of them, but it's one of the groups of people that turn those transistors into computational power. It's, mm -hmm. it's not a law of physics that computers will get faster. It's in right. some sense a law that there will be more transistors. Mm -hmm. um, the, the algorithms thing, I'm, I was interested in your, uh, your matrix computation graph because years ago, decades ago, I saw a graph from a Martin Schultz at Yale mm -hmm. that looked at just what you were looking at. In fact, what it did was to fix the algorithm uh, for matrix operations and go through generation after generation of, of uh, control data machine and at the same time fix the machine and go through generation after generation of algorithms and the algorithmic improvements actually dominated yes. the computer power improvement and more recently that's been shown to be the case in optimization. There's some very nice work by Martin Grolschel and others that show that uh, optimization problems really have benefited far more from algorithmic improvements than from hardware speed improvements. So, so yeah. all of these would work in partnership. Yes. To I get quite concur. In fact, I, I chose a relatively small problem so that the improvements in the complexity exponent of the algorithm would match Moore's law over that 36 years. If we went to real, you know, astrophysical scales for gravitation or real multi-scale electrostatics computations or whatever, the improvements from algorithms would have been far greater than architecture alone. Yeah. But this was a 1992 insight from the original Blue Book that I think has, has spawned a lot of good conversation between the communities. Thank you, Ed. Thanks again, David.